All right. Uh, I have a lot of material. Uh, I am quite happy that I have two opportunities to address you on this topic. Originally, Jeff asked me to do this, and I only had uh, time to do one, but one of the speakers had to pull out, which then gave me the opportunity to uh, expand my lecture. Uh, but I do have a lot of material, so I want to get uh, right into it. Anyone who uh, has been actively engaged in evangelism and apologetics to Jews and Muslims who think of themselves as strict or pure monotheists, which is their uh, question-begging way of conflating monotheism and Unitarianism, as well as engaged with those who comprise the kingdom of the cults, which are uh, typically anti-Trinitarian, know that all of these groups not only reject the doctrine of the Trinity, but one of the main ways they do so is by observing, or at least alleging, claiming, asserting, that the Old Testament says nothing about the Trinity and is at least functionally, if not dogmatically, Unitarian. Now by functionally Unitarian, I mean that at the very least, they would say the Old Testament only tells us about one person in the Godhead. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily say there is only one person, but that's all it really tells us. There are others who would make the, the claim much stronger and would say uh, that it's dogmatically Unitarian. But in any case, the Old Testament is not Trinitarian. It doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, the implications of this should be obvious. Uh, either you must reject, then, the... New Testament witness, which is Trinitarian, which is true in the case of Jews, because the New Testament is understood to teach the doctrine of the Trinity, Jews will reject the New Testament wholesale. Or you have to say that the, since the Old Testament is essentially Unitarian, then the New Testament must be read in light of it. That assumption must be uh, uh, enforced, if you will, onto the text of the New Testament, because otherwise you'd have to say that the New Testament contradicts the Old. So if you begin with that assumption, you either take a Jewish route, which says the New Testament's not uh, authoritative, or you take the route of forcing the New Testament into uh, a Unitarian framework. Or you could take the Muslim route of simply saying that the New Testament witness is only authoritative when it agrees with monotheism. And that's basically the, the view of Muslims, even though it's fundamentally inconsistent with the Quran. Uh, I don't want to uh, take that rabbit trail, but the Quran doesn't teach that the Bible's been corrupted, but in fact teaches that it's been uh, preserved. But in any case, uh, these are the implications for uh, these different groups. Now, lamentably, since the 1800s, <clears throat> in the name of progressive revelation, there's been an increasing number of Christians who would agree with, uh, with this assumption that the Old Testament only teaches the unity of God and doesn't say anything about uh, any kind of uh, plurality or personal plurality in the Godhead. The, this downgrade trend, as H.C. Leopold, who is a great commentator, but in his commentary, uh, on Genesis, uh, he refers to it as a downgrade trend. But this downgrade trend goes against the position of the church, which was virtually unanimous for 1,800 years, uh, from the early patristic period, through the medieval period, through the reformers, and even the post-reformation period. The church has held that the Old Testament is not only not bereft of any Trinitarian import, but is a has, is a rich repository of Trinitarian revelation, such that the patriarchs, the prophets, and the pious Israelites of old did not worship God as a barren unity, but as one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Now, I don't have time to quote, as I could and have done elsewhere, uh, father after father, medieval theologian after medieval theologian, and so forth. So let me just read for you for a moment, uh, a quote that comes from Richard Mueller's magnum opus, Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics. This is from the fourth volume, and if you're familiar with that series, you know that uh, what, what Mueller is doing is he's showing the continuity of Reformed thought in the 16 and 1700s with what came before it. Uh, it had been alleged that the Protestant scholastics, who gave a very academic form to the faith in the 16 and 1700s 
were departing from the position of earlier reformers like Luther and Calvin and Beza and Zwingli. And, and so he, he's arguing that that's not the case. Well, here's what he tells us in his uh, fourth volume, which is on the Trinity. The Reformed Orthodox, that's, he's referring to the 16 and 1700s, insisted against the Socinians, the Socinians were the Unitarians of the day, the Reformed Orthodox insisted against the Socinians that plurality of persons in the Godhead is proved not only from the New, but also from the Old Testament. On this point, their assumptions were fully in accord with the teachings of all centuries of Christianity, from the patristic period and the medieval ages uh, through the Reformation, or the Middle Ages, sorry. In particular, the Reformed Orthodox concern to identify a Trinitarian faith in the Old Testament echoes the traditional assumption emphasized by early Reformed tradition of the unity of the faith and of the promise of salvation from the beginnings of the biblical narrative, an assumption that included the claim that fundamental teachings of Christianity were available to the patriarchs. Now, to take just one example uh, to show you uh, where Mueller is getting this, this notion, uh, from the Protestant Orthodox period at least, uh, Francis Turretin in his Institutes of Elenctic Theology gave various arguments over against the Socinians and the Remonstrants, the Arminians of the time, uh, for why the Trinity is a fundamental article of the true religion. Now, I'm not going to give you those arguments. I'm happy to talk to anybody about those, or you can just look them up in Turretin uh, on your own. But he gives several arguments to prove that the Trinity is a fundamental article necessary to the true religion, necessary to the true faith. From that, then, he deduces that the Trinity must have been made known under the Old Covenant. Otherwise, the saints of old did not have something that was necessary and fundamental to the true faith. And so he goes on to write in his section on the Trinity, from the arguments adduced by us before to prove the necessity of this doctrine as a fundamental article, it might be satisfactorily inferred that it was revealed and known under the Old Testament, since fundamentals are the same among all believers admitting neither of increase nor diminution. It therefore becomes necessary to establish against both the Socinians and Remonstrants uh, the truth of this mystery, not only from the New, but also from the Old Testament. Now I should add something here. I, I didn't realize as I was thinking about uh, speaking on this topic uh, how that part of that might be confusing. Uh, the Remonstrants, whom I said were the Arminians uh, of the time, and he's writing against them, who deny that the Trinity is a fundamental article. Well, th there is a distinction here. They're not like the Socinians who deny that it's an article of faith, but at the time, they rejected the notion that it was a fundamental article. But the Reformed have always held that it's a, a fundamental article, and they've done so in continuity with all previous generations of the church. Well, before looking at why the church has historically held this view, something I'll begin to do towards the end of this lecture and all the more in the next lecture, what I want to do is lay out the argument of anti-Trinitarians and then second, explain the inadequacy of attempting to deal with or respond to that objection simply by appealing to progressive revelation, which is the idea that God didn't make himself known as triune in the old. He only did that under the new covenant. Well, first of all, if this assumption is true, and I'll often just refer to this assumption, and by that I mean the assumption that the Old Testament is Unitarian, that it's not Trinitarian. If this assumption is true, then we have to grant that there is a certain logic or prima facie plausibility to the rejection of uh, non-Christians to the doctrine of the Trinity or to the New Testament or to how it's read. For example, any Jew worth his salt may rightly point out, and they often do point out, that God through Moses expressly forbade Israel from listening to any later would-be prophet or teacher who sets forth any God or gods other than the one who already made himself known to them at the Exodus. Deuteronomy 13, if a, dream, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder 
And the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Don't miss the Exodus connection. It'll be relevant later. Who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. What they point out from the law is, of course, reiterated over and over again in every section of Scripture. For example, in the Psalms, Psalm 81, 8 through 10, the Lord reminded Israel that he and he alone saved and made himself known to them at the Exodus, and therefore they belong to him and are obligated to serve him and are not to follow any strange or foreign deity. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would listen to me, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. This was the Lord's way of saying, don't speak to strangers. Well, as in the law and the Psalms, so also in the prophets. In a a section of the the prophet uh, Isaiah, Uh, He refers back to this event, and this is a passage you're probably familiar with, but you should hear it in this context. Recall, he's talking about the Exodus. In fact, he's really looking forward to a new Exodus in this section, but he's referring back to the old Exodus. Uh, He says, You are my witnesses, the Lord through Isaiah, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Now, that part, by the way, is how it reads literally in the Hebrew. A lot of English translations have it saying, I am he. But this is one of those places where God identifies himself as the I am. Uh, You are my witnesses so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord and there is no Savior besides me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Even from eternity I am, and there's none who can deliver out of my hand. By the way, you should hear, uh, even as I read that, echoes uh, at least, uh, or it's it's the original statement that's echoed later by the Lord Jesus in John chapter 10. Remember when he says that the sheep can't be taken from his hand. Uh, This is a statement that Jesus is echoing, which shows us that he is claiming to be this God. But in any case, that's not the Jewish view, right? The Jews are saying, God did not make himself known as triune in the Old Testament. And he expressly tells us not to listen to anyone who would come along later uh, and, and proclaim another God. Uh, to borrow and adapt the language of Paul, all of these passages from the law, the Psalms, and the prophets are essentially the Old Testament's way of saying, if anyone comes and preaches to you another God or gods other than the one that was already made known to you, let him be anathema. Well, to the mind of the contemporary Jew, these passages fit Jesus, the apostles, Christianity to a T. I mean, think, of, think of the implications. Jesus came and proclaimed a great sign or wonder that would vindicate and confirm his claim to be the Son of God. Now, ordinarily, people think the fact that Jesus rose from the dead trumps all arguments against Christianity. If Jesus rose from the dead, we better listen to him. And, and that's true, provided we can answer this objection. If we can't answer this objection, then we've got a problem because the law says if you believe if somebody comes along and performs a sign that's not adequate their doctrine of god the god they proclaim has to be the same god who made himself known to israel it can't be a strange god and i can assure you from the jewish perspective the trinity is a strange god remember when paul went to the the uh, 
uh, the pagans in, in Athens in Acts 17, it was the pagans to whom God was unknown. God was not unknown to Israel. God made himself known to them. Well, while this assumption enables Jews to dismiss the Trinity or the, whole the New Testament completely, in the hands of anti-Trinitarians who profess faith, it becomes the means by which they ride roughshod over the New Testament. I can't tell you how many conversations I've been in where uh, as soon as they don't know what to say about that particular text, immediately they fly off to the fact the Old Testament doesn't teach the Trinity. Jews are not Trinitarians. Jews are Unitarians. They believe in only one person in the Godhead. Jesus was a Jew. In fact, you know what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman? We worship what we know. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus said, we worship what we know. Jesus was a Jew, and he explicitly makes this point over and against the Samaritan woman who had, I, uh, the differences between the Samaritans and the Jews are certainly not as uh, wide as the difference between Trinitarians and Unitarians. So if, in fact, the Old Testament's Unitarian, Jesus being a Jew, I mean, this is, again, this is the argument of non-Christians. I want you to feel the weight of this then they'll argue that the New Testament cannot be read as if it's denying that or contradicting it, or else you have to deny the New Testament. Moreover, not only did Jesus say, we worship what we know as a, as a Jew, but remember, Jesus quoted the Shema, the central affirmation of Jewish monotheism. Right? Repeatedly, we, we read in the Gospels, Mark 12, Matthew 22, other places, where Jesus cites the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And what makes that all the more significant is Jesus is saying it in response to the Jews. Remember, the Jews are, are coming to Jesus, especially this, this uh, is obvious in Matthew's account. They're coming to Jesus trying to trap him, trying to catch him. So first, you have the Pharisees or the, 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 uh, the Herodians and so forth coming to Jesus, trying to trap him. You get the Sadducees, you get the Pharisees, the scribes. They're all coming at Jesus in turn, and he's answering each one. Well, this is the last of their tests to Jesus. And they say, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he cites the Shema. But it, it's even stronger than that. Because in Mark's account, Mark records that the scribe who asked Jesus the question Reply to Jesus in this way. Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there's no one else besides him. So this Jewish scribe who has a particular understanding of that, which according to contemporary Jews and anti-Trinitarian cultists was Unitarian, he has an, a Unitarian understanding of it. He goes on to commend Jesus and then what does Jesus do? Does Jesus disagree with him? No, it goes on to tell us when Jesus saw that he, the scribe, had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So Jesus doesn't disagree with this man. Well, again, I, I, uh, I'm hoping you're feeling the weight of this. And I, and I do it this way because my own experience, uh, sort of, this, this is my own experience. I'm trying to take you through it a little bit. I was converted in a very hostile context, a context very hostile to the gospel, I was surrounded by anti-Trinitarians of various stripes, Nation of Islam, Islam, Echinkar, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm not saying all these people were hostile uh, you know, physically, some were, uh, but uh, I don't want you to think of all those groups as, as responding in exactly the same way, but they certainly were uh, quite uh, confrontational. And so I had to think through these issues, uh, and I, sp I spoke to a lot of Jewish people as well, in fact, I'll tell you a story about one of those conversations later. I had my own dialogue with Trifo experience, and if you're familiar with uh, Justin Martyr's writings, you'll know, you'll know what I'm alluding to here. But this really is the big gun behind much of what drives Unitarianism. Even when they don't fly off to this assumption to try and sidestep a passage from the New Testament, uh, it's always in the background driving their uh, attempt to explain a text of Scripture in the New Testament uh, in a different way. You know, they'll explain it in ways that seem to us in, you know, really far-fetched, uh, but from their perspective, it, it, it's not as far-fetched when you consider the necessity of making all things conform 
to what God has spoken already in the previous scriptures. Well, uh, what then uh, is the answer to this? Well, before I, I get to the answer that I, I have already uh, suggested to you is my own answer, the, the answer that Christians have given for 1800 years, I want you to, to know the view and, and, and the inadequacy, uh, in my view, of uh, what has become increasingly popular among Christians in, in terms of responding. Now, I want to make it clear these are Christians, they, they're Orthodox Trinitarians, but for, for many, the, the, it can simply be uh, dealt with by saying that God uh, didn't reveal himself as triune in the Old Testament, but he did in the New. Right? According to this view, Revelation is organic and progressive, which means that uh, it, it, it unfolds. And I agree with this, but I, I don't agree with how this is used. So uh, don't think as I'm, as I'm doing this that I disagree with the notion of progressive revelation. Of course, when God speaks more, we know more. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the God who speaks more is, is fundamentally unknown uh, and isn't known until uh, later uh, as, as triune. But, uh, so, so essentially the view is that, that God was, was known as one under the Old Covenant, but as three in one under the New Covenant. Now the person most responsible for introducing this view into Reformed and Evangelical circles was the late B.B. Warfield, who was without doubt a theological giant. Like I told you, the people who take this view are Orthodox Christians. I don't want that to be misunderstood. However, I think the view is inadequate and needs to be addressed for the sake of the truth of uh, the Trinity over and against these groups. But Warfield was appropriately dubbed the Lion of Princeton. He, he was a theological giant. In fact, I would encourage all of you to go out and get Warfield's writings if you can. Even his Trinitarian writings, especially his Trinitarian writings on the New Testament. There's hardly anyone I can think of whose, whose work is on par with Warfield's. Uh, and one book that you won't find in his uh, collected writings, or they're, they're, they like to trick you when they do this. Uh, 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 Warfield has a, uh, several volumes, his collected works, but they're not his complete works. There's also the collected shorter writings of Warfield, but even that doesn't contain all of, writings, uh, all of Warfield's writings. Uh, so you, you can find a bunch of things out there. And one that's not found in any of those sets is uh, his book, The Lord of Glory, on the New Testament witness to the deity of Christ. And it's simply grand. Uh, in fact, I, I believe Dr. White for quite a time, maybe still, uh, was selling it on uh, the AOMN website. In any case, Warfield was a theological giant. I'm certainly not uh, denying that. However, uh, according to Warfield, the doctrine of the Trinity is not found in the Old Testament. And I want you to understand his view, because I really believe that the reasoning of Warfield contains things that are, are actually helpful to seeing just how the Trinity was revealed in the Old Testament and, and helping us to prove that. So let, what is Warfield's view? Well, first of all, according to Warfield, from the general revelation that comes to all men through creation and conscience, all men know that God exists and certain things about him. Right? They know that he's spiritual, uh, that he's powerful, uh, that he's personal, that he's worthy of worship, those sorts of things. That comes to all men on the plane of nature, Warfield says. And this provides the background presupposition with which we come to the uh, Old Testament. Right? That's why the Old Testament, Warfield would say, and I think he's right, the Old Testament doesn't argue for the existence of God. It takes it as a given. It takes it as a given because God has made himself known to all men through creation. Right? That's what scripture does say that. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they pour forth knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their words have gone out to all the world. So God has spoken to all men. He's constantly speaking. In fact, go read the Psalm. Psalm 19 is is marvelous. It's like God is pouring out buckets full of knowledge, such that Paul, or in the, in the New Testament, in Romans, could say that the unbeliever is without excuse who doesn't believe in God. Right? There's no excuse. There, in fact, he says there's no apologetic. It's not as if the, the, the existence of God is a bare possibility, that they, they, they could know that there's a God. They, in fact, know that there's a God, and the, their sin, therefore, is all the more culpable. So Warfield says this is the 
uh, the truth revealed through creation. According to Warfield, creation uh, uh, doesn't re though reveal necessarily uh, that God uh, will save sinners, or if, if it does reveal something of His goodness and from that one could infer uh, His gracious disposition, it, it doesn't tell us anything about how God, <clears throat> sorry, talking too much to the, to the guys. <laughs> um, it doesn't tell us how God would do that. Right? So here's a quote. This is from uh, his selected shorter writings. The first volume, it's, the article is simply titled God. He says, this primary idea of God, theism, in which is summed up what is known as, as theism, is the product of that general revelation which God makes to all men of himself on the plane of nature. The truths involved in it are continually reiterated, enriched, and deepened in the scriptures, but they're not so much revealed by them as presupposed as the foundation of the special revelation with which the scriptures busy themselves, the great revelation of the, great, uh, of the grace of God to sinners. On the plane of nature, men can learn only what God necessarily is and what by virtue of his essential attributes he must do. A special communication from him is requisite to assure us that what in, in his infinite love he will do for the recovery of of lost sinners from their guilt and misery. So creation reveals God's existence. Special revelation is needed to show that God is graciously disposed towards sinners. As Warfield goes on to say, it's not through creation, though, that God makes himself known as triune. It's only uh, uh, through redemption. Uh, go on to quote Warfield. For the full revelation of this, his grace and the redemption of sinners, there was requisite and even more profound unveiling of the mode of his existence, by which he has been ultimately disclosed as including in the unity of his being a distinction of persons, by virtue of which it is the same God from whom, through whom, and by whom are all things, who is at once the Father who provides, the Son who accomplishes, and the Spirit who applies redemption. Only in the uncovering of this supernal mystery of the Trinity is the revelation of what God is completed. So now you're thinking, well now, if God doesn't reveal himself as triune in creation, but he does in redemption, well then why doesn't the Old Testament teach the Trinity? Isn't the Old Testament about redemption? Well, Warfield uh, goes on to say the following, that there is no hint of the Trinity in the general revelation made on the plane of nature is due to the fact that nature has nothing to say of redemption, in the process of which alone are the depths of the divine nature made known. That it is explicitly revealed only in the New Testament is due to the fact that not until the New Testament stage of revelation was reached was the redemption which was being prepared through the whole Old Testament economy actually accomplished. And then, as I said, I, I want you to hear this from Warfield because this is, uh, this, this is the source, the fountainhead uh, from which this comes from many later writers and Warfield was the, the best to articulate this view. So pardon some of these uh, long quotes from Warfield, but uh, when Warfield says that the, the Trinity is only made known in the completed redemption that we have, uh, he's referring to the fact that it, it, it doesn't become known until the Son becomes incarnate and the Spirit is poured out upon the church. Now certainly that is a revelation of the Trinity. I'm, I'm by no means rejecting that. In fact, this is the high point of the revelation of the Trinity. God did make himself known through the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Spirit. And the New Testament does you know, breathe. That's the atmosphere within which the New Testament is written. That's the context within which the early church is reading the New Testament. Right? This was their experience. They knew the God who had redeemed them by means of the Son and the Spirit. And so when they read the New Testament, they're reading it with Trinitarian eyes. They're reading it as those who had been saved by the triune God, chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, sealed by the Spirit, blessed God, three in one. So that's certainly, the, the, that's certainly true. But according to Warfield then, <clears throat> this is uh, when the doctrine of the Trinity becomes known uh, for the first time. Right? It's not known at all prior to that. Abraham, did not, Abraham, the friend of God, did not know uh, that God is triune. He did not know the Son or the, the, the distinct, uh, Him as a distinct person. 
Uh, Moses, who spoke with God face to face, never got around to discussing that God was three persons. God never revealed that to him. That's the, the position of Warfield. Well, so here's, here's the quote from Warfield. In fact, I'll just skip over this lengthy quote and give you a shorter one. He says, this doctrine did not originate in the extra-Christian world, which is true, but with whatever adumbrations in the Old Testament revelation was first distinctly revealed in the missions of the Son and Spirit and first clearly taught by Jesus and his apostles. Now, you'll note that Warfield does speak here of adumbrations of the Trinity, but unlike earlier writers who use that language, he doesn't think that they are revelational. No person reading the Old Testament would take any of these adumbrations as having Trinitarian significance. For example, the plurals of Genesis, right? Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis 1.26. Or 3.22, behold, the man has now become like one of us. By the way, that's not a plural of majesty. There, there's no such thing as a plural of majesty being used with verbs in Hebrew and uh, us make in, in Hebrew is a verb. But besides that, Genesis 3.22, it's not God saying like the Queen of England, we are not amused. It says the man has now become like one of us. Okay, that's not a plural of majesty. Moreover, just think of 11.7, right? In 11.7, God says, come, let us go down and there confound their language. That's said in response to the tower builders who say, let us build a tower, right? So if that's a plural of majesty, was it one guy uh, trying to build a tower uh, that reaches to the heavens? No, and, and the divine response is, let us go down and confound their language. And by the way, how does that get reversed? It gets reversed when uh, the Son, having ascended to the Father, pours out the Spirit at Pentecost, right? Is that Trinitarian? It's as if God said, let us go down and now unite their languages, right? Well, so I mean, the, the New Testament writers uh, certainly uh, take these things in a Trinitarian way. Well, uh, here's, here's what Warfield says. It is pl a plain matter of fact that none who have depended on the revelation embodied in the Old Testament alone ever attained to the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so the Old Testament does not reveal the Trinity, and as a corollary of that, the Old Testament saints did not know God as triune. Well, what are the problems with this? Okay, from the perspective of anti-Trinitarians, this response is inadequate and unpersuasive. Because if the doctrine of the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament and suddenly appears in the New, then it doesn't really look like we have organic growth, right? We, we, we don't have this, this progressive uh, growth, but an extreme leap from one idea about God, which is at least functionally Unitarian, to an altogether different idea about God that is dogmatically Trinitarian. Okay? And if that's not the, the very definition of a strange God, a new God, a God you haven't known, I mean, I don't know what is. I mean, when I think, I mean, think of yourself, when you think of yourselves over and against other groups that claim to be Christians but don't worship the triune God, do you just think of yourselves as, as having uh, an incidental difference? Or do you think of it as fundamental, the difference as fundamental? Well, then you should likewise recognize if the Old Testament is not essentially Trinitarian, then this is not a, a small difference. This is a huge difference. This is a difference that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, now, you might think of it as uh, kind of like uh, I was thinking about this uh, earlier. Uh, this, this reminds me of Goldschmidt's hopeful monster hypothesis in biology. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with that, but recall that according to Darwin's view, uh, species arise through innumerable incremental changes over long periods of time. Well, you know, I, I hope, that, that, that there's a, a dearth of evidence for that in the, in the fossil record. In fact, what we find in the fossil record often is what looks like species that are just there, uh, which uh, from the scientific perspective means that they just sort of suddenly arose, right? You have things like the Cambrian explosion and stuff like that. Well, people like Goldschmidt said that, uh, well, okay, then uh, things don't really change all that slowly. Uh, they take place rather quickly. And, and so to, to give you a crude analogy, it was like a chicken would lay an egg and out came an alligator, right? <laughs> well, well, that's essentially how the, the non-Trinitarian uh, is looking at the Christian view. You're saying, you know, God in the Old Testament laid an egg and in the New Testament there's an alligator, right? I mean, that's their perspective. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, 
suggesting anything like that. I'm not being irreverent, but that's, that's how they uh, look at things. In fact, think about this. Here's one of the questions that Christians have difficulty answering, and they do so because they are, they're taking this approach, or at least those who are, uh, other people are taking this. Oh, I have 13 minutes. I better hurry up. Uh, the, the, uh, the argument is this. God revealed himself as a person in the Old Testament. We come to the New Testament, we find out about two more persons, the Son and the Spirit. How do you know that God is only three persons? You can't say, well, because God only said he's three persons, right? Because God only said he was one in the Old Testament. Now you know he's three. How do you know he's not four persons? Five persons, ten persons. Pretty soon we're Hindus, right? Um, well, that, that all stems from this idea that God didn't make himself known to us from the very first. If God has always made himself known as triune, there's no reason to even think about that. By the way, there's a more sophisticated theological, philosophical uh, response to why God is three and only three. But just in terms of biblical theology, working through scripture, if that's your approach, it really does bring up those kinds of questions. Now, in saying all this, I, I said I'm not rejecting the notion of organic growth or progressive revelation. What I'm saying is revelation really is organic. There is continuity all along the way, such that what we, while we do know more about God, we, do, we still know Him. We've known Him all along, and we, we learn more about the Trinity. But the, you know, it, it's one thing to say that there are some truths that God waited to tell us about. It's another thing to say something fundamental to the true religion, to the true worship of God, was not made known from the beginning. Though I do recognize that the New Testament tells us a lot more about uh, the Trinity. But, but just take, uh, for example, the idea of the, the new birth and the future resurrection. Some people will say, look, those things were not obvious from the Old Testament, right? Uh, we didn't, it was in the New Testament when Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, as Paul says. So can't we just say that the Trinity was like that? Well, I'm already suggesting that we can't because it's a fundamental uh, article. Uh, but, uh, but ask yourself this question. Did Jesus think those doctrines of, you know, they're important obviously, but they're of less comparable significance to the Trinity. But did Jesus teach that those doctrines were unknown in the Old Testament? Didn't Jesus say to, to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? regarding the new birth, right? And didn't Jesus silence the Sadducees regarding the future resurrection when he said, you err, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God? By the way, that's in the same context where Jesus cites the Shema. I may come back to that because there's something very significant there. Well, so the point is that uh, while the New Testament says more about certain things like the new birth and future resurrection, these don't appear de novo, out of the blue. They're there in the Old Testament, so much so that Jesus can upbraid Nicodemus and uh, altogether rout the Sadducees for their ignorance. And by the way, notice that the, this, this ignorance, this uh, uh, different perspective doesn't represent the position of all Jews. This is very important as well. And not all Jews re rejected the future resurrection, did they? The Pharisees didn't, the Sadducees did. And so what I'm suggesting here is just because you find one Jew, even in New Testament times, maybe even in the New Testament, uh, with a certain assumption, it doesn't mean that's true of all Jews. And I'll, I'll come back to that too in my second lecture. Well, not only does the New Testament teach the new birth and future bodily uh, resurrection are found in the Old Testament, but guess what? The New Testament itself tells us that the Old Testament taught the doctrine of the Trinity. Think, for example, of the first chapter of Hebrews. Dr. White made reference to this yesterday, at least. After asserting that the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His nature, the one by whom God created the ages and uh, through whom He upholds all things, right? the one who provided eternal redemption, after speaking of the Son in, in this exalted way, the author of Hebrews goes on to support this with a litany of citations from the Old Testament. Psalm 2, Psalm 45, Psalm 97, Psalm 102, Psalm 110. Over and over again, he cites the Old Testament as the proof, the support for his claim regarding the Son. Does the author of Hebrews think that these passages don't teach 
the full deity, the distinct personhood of, of the Son from the Father and His full deity? Certainly He does. Otherwise, it makes no sense for Him to appeal to them. Remember the whole point of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews is, is trying to uh, tell the early Jewish Christians why they shouldn't be going back to Judaism, because there were those who were tempted in light of the, the persecution they were enduring, as they see the temple uh, services continuing as they had before Jesus came. You know, they're told that Jesus fulfilled all these things, but look, they're all still happening. The priests are still going, they're making sacrifices, the Jews are having a merry time, and we're being persecuted. So they're being tempted to go back to that. And the author of Hebrews is saying, don't go back to that. Jesus is superior. And he points them to the law. If they were doubting the New Testament, right, and they were tempted to go back to this, then it wouldn't, you know, they're, they're doubting the authority of, of the new. And so the author is pointing to the old. And he's saying, this uh, teaches us the deity of Christ. And of course, the author of Hebrews isn't the only author of the New Testament who quotes the Old in proof of the divinity of Christ. And these aren't the only passages he could have quoted. Think, for example, of Isaiah 7, 14, where the coming Messiah is called Emmanuel, God with us. Or Isaiah 9, 6, where he's called the mighty God. Or Malachi 3, 1, where he's called the Lord, a particular construction, by the way, that always refers to Yahweh in Hebrew. ha Edon, and it says the Lord uh, who will suddenly come to his temple. The temple is referred to as his temple. Or Zechariah 12.10, where the Lord says, they'll look upon me whom they have pierced and they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Or Jeremiah 23, where the coming Messiah is called Yahweh our righteousness. Okay? The author of Hebrews cites the Old Testament and he only cites a smidgen of what he could have quoted. Well, even as the New Testament authors pointed to Old Testament verses that spoke of the coming of the Messiah, they also pointed to passages that spoke of the advent of the Spirit. Certainly, the Old Testament speaks of the coming of the Spirit, doesn't it? This is why Peter could cite Joel in, in, in Acts chapter 2 in explanation of uh, what was taking place, right? He says that uh, Joel had prophesied that the Spirit would be poured out upon us. He could have also cited many other passages, Isaiah 32, 15, where it speaks of the Spirit. It says, when the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, Right, in the days of the Messiah. Isaiah 43 or 44, 3, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Or Ezekiel 36, 27, that great new covenant promise. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Right, this is why the New Testament repeatedly refers to the spirit as the promised spirit or the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was promised. Now, now put this together. I want you to, to see this in terms of its relevance to what uh, Warfield was arguing. Warfield said the doctrine of the Trinity is only disclosed in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Spirit, and that the New Testament is to be read in light of those two fundamental facts, or that composite of facts. But if you already have in the Old Testament God saying this is what He'll do, and he speaks in terms of a divine Messiah, distinct from himself, and of his spirit, also distinct from himself, and personal, and I'll show that too. Then you already have this, these events anticipated in the Old Testament, and therefore, at the very least, you have Old Testament believers who have uh, uh, these ideas, right? They have the idea of a divine second person and, and a third person. And so they, they wouldn't have been utterly bereft of, of such an understanding. But think about this, and, and this really starts to gear us up for our, my next lecture. Jeff did say I could go over just a little. I might have made that up, but uh, no. um, not only do the, does the New Testament speak of Old Testament predictions that talk about a coming divine Messiah, a coming uh, of the Spirit of the Lord, they also, if the, if the Messiah is a divine person, and the Spirit's a divine person, they have the divine attributes, then they're eternal. Which means, unless you think they were sitting idly by in heaven while the Father was active in the Old Testament, they must have been active during the Old Covenant period. Right? Wasn't the Son active? Was the Spirit active in the Old Covenant? Well, the New Testament writers certainly thought so. Because they knew that the, the persons of the Trinity were God, they saw the persons of the Trinity as active in the Old Testament especially at the redemption from Egypt, that seminal event by which God made himself known to Israel as their God. 
What does the author of Hebrews say in Hebrews 11? Listen to uh, these words. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Moses considered Egypt's treasures and sin's pleasures as worthless compared to the, the, the blessing of being of suffering along with Christ's people and, and bearing the reproach of Christ, identifying with Him. How could He do that? How did Moses suffer the reproach of Christ if Christ was not a person known to Him uh, and the one whom He was ultimately listening to? And again, I'll show you this even more fully from the Old Testament. Moreover, this is why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 10 of the Israelites who came out of Egypt through the Red Sea, they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. The spiritual rock that followed them. Don't confuse that with the rock that Moses struck. If you look at Deuteronomy 32, God repeatedly refers to himself as the rock who bore Israel, who took them through the wilderness. Here Paul is saying Christ was that rock. And Paul, just a few verses later in, in 1 Corinthians 10, could say, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents in the wilderness. Christ sent serpents among them to punish them for uh, rebelling against him. So likewise, the book of Jude, Jude verse 5, what does it say? I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Again, the writers of the New Testament think of Jesus as active at the redemption, that event by which God made himself known to Israel. And the same is true with respect to the Spirit. They not only speak of the Spirit as uh, a future promise, but of the Spirit as active. He's active from day one, right? <laughs> In Genesis 1-2, you already have mention of the Spirit there as God is, is creating the world. He's actively brooding over it, sustaining creation, a divine act. But over and over again, the New Testament uh, cites the Old and it attributes it to the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit who spoke by the prophets. Acts 1-16, 4-25, numerous passages over and over again. In fact, one of my favorite, look, look uh, at Acts 21-11 where, where uh, it says, Thus says the Holy Spirit. That's Divine speech, right? When in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. Now in the New, it becomes, uh, thus says the Spirit. But Peter, in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11 said, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. The point is that the authors of the New Testament saw the Spirit as active in the Old Testament as the one who spoke by the prophets. The one who, in fact, the Old Testament tells us settled upon Moses, right? Moses spoke by the Spirit. This is why Peter, or Stephen in Acts 17, excuse me, Acts 7, I wrote that wrong, could say to the Stanhedrin, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Stephen is referring not only to their rejection, but he's saying they're doing exactly what their fathers have always done. They're resisting the voice of the Spirit. And in referring to the fathers, he's not simply talking about you know, the generation just prior to them. He's especially thinking of that Exodus generation. If you read the context of uh, Acts 7, he's saying that this is how you guys have been from the beginning, and, and here you are continuing it to this day. That's why the author of Hebrews, again, quoting Psalm 95, which refers back to the Exodus generation, could speak in this way. Therefore, the Holy Spirit says, and he's quoting Psalm 95, and he's attributing it to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. Uh, they have not known my ways. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I will uh, conclude with this. The Old Covenant, as we know, proved to be inadequate to the fundamental needs of man. The redemption that uh, it accomplished was uh, a type, a shadow. It was preparatory to what God would do. 
And precisely because of that inadequacy, you have the promise of a new covenant. When the, uh, the son will come to do something greater than he did before, uh, greater than delivering them from Egypt, from, from physical captivity and bondage, and the spirit will come to do a greater work as well. Right? He'll, he'll uh, dwell in our hearts by faith and, and cause us to walk in his ways. But listen to how the author of Hebrews tells us about that great promise. This is in Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit also bore witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and write them <clears throat> on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So with that, I will conclude. Jeff will come and tell me that I... All right, I hope you brought your Bibles for this session. Uh, I do have to confess, though, that as I walked in here, I forgot to bring mine. Uh, but happily, the pastor of the church does have a Bible. Um, and I'm actually thankful that he read John 1, 1 through 18. That wasn't something we discussed, but uh, I'll probably go to that later. I, I didn't necessarily think of doing this, but I, I, I just may uh, have some things to say about that. Well, I, I do want to read uh, a portion of scripture that I was planning on um, reading. It's a relatively lengthy section of scripture from Isaiah 63, verses 7 through 19. And as you turn there and uh, are preparing your mind to listen to what we read in those verses, I want you to remember a number of things. Uh, first of all, I want you to recall Warfield's view, and, and remember I disagreed with him, but at the same time, Warfield actually says what I think, point, uh, if we just tweak it a bit, will point us in the right direction. Remember that Warfield, uh, incorrectly, says that the Trinity is revealed in the incarnation of the Son and the Spirit. What I've disagreed with is the idea that that's when the Trinity is revealed for the first time. Certainly, it's, uh, it's a revelation of the Trinity, and it's certainly a floodlight, if you will. And when we read the New Testament, we're reading it in the context of that, uh, those great redemptive events, the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring uh, of the Spirit. So when we read these, uh, this passage, though, I want you to realize that this is talking about that original, th th well, there's a lot going on in this passage, and I'll have, I'll have comments to make regarding that. But I want you to uh, realize the, the, the echoes of the Exodus in this passage. This is an Old Testament text. Okay, let, let's read it from verses 7 uh, through 19. 19. I shall make mention of the loving kindnesses of the Lord, the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted them according to his compassion and according to the abundance of his loving kindnesses. For he said, this is a reference back to the Exodus, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he became their savior. Think Exodus 4. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. This is, again, an echo of the Exodus. Exodus 3, God saw their affliction and came down. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned himself to become their enemy. He fought against them. Then his people remembered the days of old, of Moses. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit in the midst of them, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths like the horse in the wilderness they did not stumble as the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your mighty deeds? The stirrings of your heart and your compassion are restrained toward me. For you are our Father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us. You, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. 
Why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while. Our adversaries have trodden it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who were never called by your name. And thus ends the reading of God's word. Well, as I read that, I hope you noticed several things. In the first place, this text clearly harkens back to the redemption of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Isaiah is remembering and celebrating the loving kindness, compassion, and goodness of God, who in seeing the affliction of Israel and remembering the promise that he made to Abraham came down to save them. He deigned to become their savior and redeemer, receive them to himself as sons, uh, receive them to himself as sons, and perform mighty deeds on their behalf. This is clearly drawing upon the Exodus, especially Exodus 3 and 4. As I mentioned as I was reading the text, it's there that you read that God saw the affliction of his people and has come down, remembering the promises that he made to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's in that act that he becomes their father and, and brings them into a relationship with himself uh, uh, as his sons. Second, I hope you saw that in speaking of God becoming their savior, and bringing about their redemption, he speaks not only of the Father, but also of the angel of his presence, who's referred to in verse 12 as the, that glorious arm that read, went at the right hand of Moses. Okay, the angel of his presence or his glorious arm. And he also refers to the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord, who, he, whom he set in their midst, who dwelt among them, who gave them rest. Here you have what I'm suggesting to you, not just suggesting, but uh, confidently telling you, all three persons of the Godhead, all three persons of the Trinity, and, and two of them by the same names that we know them in the New Testament, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now perhaps uh, that reference to the angel of his presence is puzzling to you. Uh, how is an angel uh, somehow the uh, person of the Trinity, a member of the Godhead? And here, you have to remember, and I'm going to demonstrate this to you, that the word angel in both Hebrew and Greek, melach and angelos, simply means messenger. Uh, the term is used, if you're looking at the original text, it's used more often than you'd realize. Uh, but it, when it's referring to human beings, it usually uses the term messenger instead of angel. But the there's no difference in the term. You can't tell what kind of being is in view just because you see the word angel. You have to determine that from the context. Let me give you an example. In Malachi 3, verse 1, God says, I'll send my messenger before my face. He'll prepare the way before me. And then the messenger whom you seek, the Lord, shall suddenly come to his temple. In both cases, the messenger who prepares the way and the messenger whose way is being prepared, the, the term in Hebrew is Melach, it means angel. In fact, the, that's found in the prophet Malachi, right? Malachi means uh, Malachi, it's uh, my angel. The prophet himself is named my messenger. That passage is quoted and applied in Mark 1 and, and said to refer to John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord Jesus, both of whom are obviously, at the very least, human beings. Right, so the, the, the Hebrew word angel and the Greek word simply means messenger and doesn't tell you what kind of being is in view. But in this text, it tells us about one who is the angel of his presence. Somehow this messenger carries with him the very presence of God. And he's identified as the one by whom God redeemed and saved his people. Now there's something further uh, significant about this text that I hope you didn't miss and if you did, I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, this text is not only uh, retrospective, but prospective. It's not just looking back to what God did for Israel, but remember the context. Here it's Isaiah is bemoaning Israel's present condition in light of her former glory. God rescued and saved her from Egyptian bondage. He put his sanctuary in their midst. He dwelt among them. But now Israel has lost that privilege. They've lost God's sanctuary. God's not dwelling in their midst. And Israel then, uh, for the people, is crying out to God, asking for God to restore them. He's asking for God to do in the future something analogous to what he did in the past. He's asking God to return to Israel and save them. 
Essentially, what he's doing then is he's asking for those persons, the Father, the angel of his presence, and the Spirit of the Lord, to do in the future what God had done for them in the past. And, and uh, really, and I don't have time to, to show all the connections here, but if you just look back two chapters, you'll see that this prayer on the part of Isaiah is actually sparked by a promise or a prediction that God himself has already given. Uh, repeatedly in the prophets, you know, the, the prophets think, uh, and the apostles and so forth, think different than we often think. Some people say if God has uh, foreordained something, if he's predicted it, if he's promised it, then why pray about it, right? Uh, but that's not the rationale or the reasoning of the prophets. For example, think of Daniel in chapter 9 of, of his book. Uh, he's reading in the prophet Jeremiah where, where Jeremiah had said that 70 years of captivity was in store for the people before the, it comes to an end. And he's reading this towards the end of that period and he immediately is prompted to pray, Lord, deliver your people, deliver us from exile. He doesn't say, Jeremiah predicted this, therefore I'm not going to pray about it. No, Jeremiah predicted this, therefore I can confidently pray on the basis of what God has promised and know that my prayer will be heard and answered. Well, Isaiah is effectively doing the same thing. Look at Isaiah 61, verses, uh, well, at least verse 1. You know, this is a familiar text. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Okay, so there's a speaker, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon him. So you at least have one of those persons mentioned by Isaiah, the Spirit of God, right? And we don't know who the speaker is per se, but whoever he is, the Spirit of God is upon him. Actually, that already tells us who the this, this speaker is. This one is anointed with the Holy Spirit, the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah, or the Christ. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. So here we have three persons. Right? He, and, and this is a prediction of the future salvation that God is going to accomplish by means of the person who's speaking, the anointed one, and his spirit whom he has set upon him. And so what I'm already suggesting to you is in the prophet Isaiah already, we have an ident identification of who that angel of his presence is. It's the coming Messiah. But he's spoken of there as already active, already active in, in fact as the one who saved and delivered Israel from Egypt together with the Spirit of the Lord. Well, let's uh, uh, look at some of these passages because I want you to, I want to fill this out and I want you to see uh, what, uh, what Isaiah thinks or what the Old Testament teaches regarding these persons. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't refer to it, but I hope you're already thinking about uh, the fulfillment of this. Right? What is the fulfillment of this? Isaiah is praying that God would send forth uh, the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit and re uh, redeem them to himself, uh, a greater redemption, and he would constitute uh, those people his sons once again. Right? Where is that fulfilled? Well, if you read Galatians chapter 4, you have an answer. In Galatians 4, uh, actually I don't have it written down here, but Galatians 4, it says, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent, the, sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so here, Paul speaks of that accomplished redemption, what Isaiah was praying for, as something accomplished by means of the son and the spirit. In, in fact, interestingly enough, it's only uh, a few verses later in the same chapter of Galatians chapter 4 where Paul speaks positively of how the uh, Galatians had received him in this way. He said, you received me as the angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Now there are some scholars who would disagree with that uh, translation of the verse, but in my view, uh, it's contextually sound as well as uh, it's certainly grammatically uh, plausible. And there are numerous scholars who hold that. But in any case, there can be no question that the Old Testament itself identifies the angel of his presence as a divine person. In fact, turn with me to uh, Exodus 24. Now at first you're going to be scratching your head, wondering why I would turn to this text and see in it 
implications for the doctrine of the Trinity. And I turn to this text not only because it is relevant, because, but because it was a text that was relevant among Jews at the time of, uh, at least after the time of Christ, in, uh, the, in light of the, the uh, incarnation and uh, outpouring of the Spirit. Most people don't know that among uh, ancient Jews, Second Temple Jews, meaning Jews prior to and during the time of Christ, actually believed that God was a, a multi-personal. The Jews were not Unitarian, and I'll give you quotes regarding that later. But this caused a great deal of difficulty for Jews when Jesus came on the scene, because now they have a particular Jew claiming to be one of those persons, and uh, the earlier Jewish thought plays right into this. Right? And so uh, this is one of the passages that later Jews tried to deal with, and you find this in the Talmud. 24 verse 1, it says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Did you catch it? Right there, you already have an indication of plurality of persons within the Godhead. Now, if you're not seeing it just yet, just keep thinking about it. Who is the speaker in this text? And what I'm pointing out here is not simply something that I've observed. Again, this was part of the discussion of Jews in the aftermath of Christianity in light of the fact that earlier Jews saw this as evidence of a plurality of persons. Well, if you're still scratching your head, here, here's the answer. The speaker is the Lord Himself. The speaker is Yahweh. But what does He say? It says, Then He, Yahweh, said to Moses, Come up the mountain to Yahweh. Why doesn't He say, Come up the mountain to to me. He says, come up to Yahweh, as if Yahweh was another person. Now, some people are tempted at this point to say, well, God is just referring to himself in the third person. And that's certainly possible. We see that sort of thing elsewhere in Scripture. Is that all that's going on here? Well, that's not what ancient Jews thought. And I, uh, I will tell you, that's not what you should be thinking. Here's what ancient Jews said was taking place here. In this passage, God is referring to the angel of the Lord. And why did they say that? Just turn one page back or one chapter back. Look at what God tells Moses in Exodus 23, just prior to this passage. In Exodus 23, verse 20, the Lord says, Behold, I'm going to send an angel, and it should be capitalized here, before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I have prepared. Notice the Lord is preparing the way for someone, right? There's, this is going to be, I'm, I'm emphasizing that because this is going to be reversed in the New Testament. Instead of the Lord preparing the way, some Israel's preparing the way for the Lord who's going to come, who, the Lord Jesus. But it says uh, he's pre, uh, going to send this angel to prepare the way before him. Who is this angel? Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Literally, it says, listen to him. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression. And this is why, because my name is in him. This particular angel bears the very name of God, and this is the grounds for saying, you better not rebel against him, because he will not pardon your transgression. He will take you to task. He will hold you accountable for your iniquity. He will not clear the guilty, uh, the guilty right? In Exodus uh, 20, in the Ten Commandments, it says that God will not uh, let the guilty go unpunished. That's what he's saying about this particular individual. And so, as the ancient Jews recognized, when, when Moses uh, immediately hears these words, come up the mountain to Yahweh, he's coming up the mountain to the one that he was just told about as the one who's going to prepare the way before them. And that person throughout Exodus 24 is identified as the Lord God. Not, not a created angel, not a created messenger, but as a divine person. Now how do we know that it's the angel that the Lord is referring to? Look at Acts chapter 7. Uh, contextually that's true. But if you look at Acts chapter 7, this is exactly what Stephen tells us. In Acts 7, remember, uh, Stephen is giving this, uh, uh, he's responding to the Sanhedrin, and he's telling them how they are resisting the Spirit, and they've always done this, 
They've rejected those whom God has raised up for them. But he's, he's in this section talking about Moses and how God raised up Moses. He called him at the burning bush. But then later, uh, listen to what it says. Uh, after It first talks about the burning bush, but then it says this in verse 35. Uh, Oh, I'm actually going to go back because this is significant too. But in verse 35, it says, This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. He's quoting Deuteronomy 18. This is the one who was in the congregation, in the wilderness, together with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. Here he's referring to Exodus 24 when Moses was called up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. And, and he specifically says it was to the angel that he was called up to speak. Well, now uh, turn back to uh, Exodus 3. You'll see that's not the first time this angel is identified as God himself. Now, the very fact that he's called an angel, as I said, doesn't mean that it's a created being, but it does at least indicate this. This person is distinct from the one who sent him. Right? If you're a messenger... You're bringing a message from someone else. So here is this person, distinguished from the Lord as a messenger, who's yet identified as a divine person. God even speaks to him, right? Come up the mountain to the Lord. It's like Psalm 110, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So in Exodus 3, remember this is the account where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and announced or declared his name to him. Remember Moses asked God his name in verse 13. Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I'll say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So the one speaking to Moses explicitly identifies himself as the eternal, self-existent God. The God who has life in himself. The God who is the source of all life, who, who can't uh, be defined in terms of anything external to him. Right? He's sufficient unto himself. But look back at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, this is, it's telling us who spoke to Moses. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When, they, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So notice, it's, the term angel here is not being used of a human or, or other creature. This angel is the God who spoke to Moses, the God who identified himself as I am that I am. Now, not even this is the first indication of the divinity of, of the angel of the Lord. Turn back to Genesis 48. And this is actually quite marvelous. Scripture uh, just has uh, so many things going on in it. It, it, it really is uh, you know, exciting to read Scripture. And I'm always puzzled. I had a friend once who, who said to me, you know, I'm having trouble. He goes, I, I, I don't have trouble praying anymore, but I just can't get into my Bible. I just know it so well. And uh, I, I, to this day, and, and my friend didn't know the Bible as, as well as he thought, but uh, to this day, I've never had that thought. I've never had that thought. Scripture continues to amaze me. But uh, here, here in Genesis 48, you have Jacob, who's going to bless the sons of Joseph, or bless Joseph by blessing his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and uh, what's, what's significant, though, is remember, this person is the one who is renamed Israel. So this is the individual Israel, whose people are going to be called the people of Israel, right? who are going to be redeemed by the angel. Okay? But listen to what Jacob says about his own life. 
What I'm telling you is if you read the life of Jacob closely, you already see the events of the Exodus foreshadowed. And we don't have time to do all of that, but listen to what he says, uh, starting in verse 15. This is Jacob's blessing. He blessed Joseph and said, The God, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, may he bless the lads. Now I emphasize that because most translations don't bring out the force of the Hebrew here. The verb is forestalled to the end of the verse and refers back to those three descriptions. Jacob's referring throughout this benediction or this, this blessing to the same person in every phrase, right? When he says, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me, may he bless the lads. He's using the singular to refer uh, to this same individual. But notice that he calls him God. He calls him the God of his fathers Abraham and Isaac. And he calls him his shepherd. No wonder Jesus in the New Testament could say that I am the good shepherd. Right? He, this is not coming out of you know, nowhere. But he also refers to the angel as the one who redeemed him from all evil. And by the way, this is the first use of the term redeemed in Scripture. And as most people will tell you, the first use of a term in Scripture is, is typically very significant. It, it's, it's full of, uh, of meaning. Well, one more, one more text regarding the angel of the Lord, uh, at least um, uh, going backwards. I, I will go forwards, actually. But if you go back to Genesis 16, this is the first reference to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And this text always blows me away because it, the, the occasion is Hagar has, has left, right? Uh, the situation's not good at home, so she's leaving. Sarah's not being nice to her. Uh, and we're told that the angel of the Lord appeared to her. But the angel of the Lord appears and doesn't say anything about who he is. We know that it's the angel of the Lord because the author of Scripture tells us. right? But, but Hagar, to Hagar, this figure appears out of the blue. And listen to what he says. Uh, uh, it's verse 7, actually. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. So here suddenly this figure who assumes the, the authority to command her to go back and submit to her mistress now tells her he's going to multiply her descendants. This is the same way that God speaks to Abraham, right? And it's a promise that only God can make. But continue reading. Then the angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you are to name him or call him Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. This is the God who sees the affliction of his own. And then it says, he, the, the child will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. This, this statement always makes me wonder why Muslims are so anxious uh, to say that Ishmael was the progenitor of uh, the Arabs. Now here he's not given very favorable mention. He'll be a wild donkey of a man and his hand will be against everyone. In any case, notice what it says, and uh, we'll actually stop there for a moment. One of the things that people will often say is uh, that the angel of the Lord is just a representative of God. And he can come and speak as if he were God, or uh, he could just speak directly and people uh, would know that he's speaking for God. But notice what it, we read in verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? So Hagar thinks that this individual is God. She says, you are a God who sees me. Now the answer of, of contemporary Jews is to say, well, Hagar was just overwhelmed and mistaken. Kind of like John in the book of Revelation. Remember when he's about to fall down at the feet of the angel? What does the angel do in that case? The angel says, don't do it. Worship God. I'm just a servant. I'm just a mere messenger. Right? 
That, this angel doesn't do this when she says that, right? This, this angel lets her words go by. But there's an even more definitive response. Did you notice that it's not simply Hagar who calls this person a divine person? It's Moses. Right? Look at verse 13. This is what Moses is saying. Moses is talking about Hagar. He says, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. The word Lord there is the word Yahweh. Moses said, she called Yahweh the God who sees me. And so now you have not simply Hagar, whom somebody might want to say is mistaken, but who isn't corrected by the angel, but now you have Moses himself saying, this angel is God himself. Now, move forward to the, the book of Judges, and then I'll, I'll make uh, some relevant comments here in light of uh, previous uh, statements. I, I love this text for many reasons, but look at verse one, and I'll just point out one interesting feature. It says, uh, before I make the, the comment that uh, I want to make here regarding the angel of the Lord, but it says, now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you the chapter, Judges 2.1. I'm sorry, I got peanut gallery back there. Uh, in Judges 2.1, it says, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. Now, there's a good bit of distance between the event that's being relayed here and what takes place in Joshua 5, but what's interesting is this connection uh, of uh, Gilgal and Bochim, because the last time you hear about, uh, when you go back to jo Joshua 5, what, what happens in Joshua 5? In Joshua 5, a mysterious figure appears to Joshua with drawn sword. And Joshua says to him, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, neither. I'm the captain of the Lord's armies, right? I'm the leader of the armies of heaven. And he says, take off your sandals because the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. It's Exodus 3. That's what the angel of the Lord told Moses at the burning bush. Take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. That's the same thing that the man said to Joshua. Well, uh, so that's the last time we hear uh, about the, the angel of the Lord uh, and so when you pick up in Judges 2.1, it's really, it's a long time later, but it says the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. So it's connecting back to that prior incident. But notice what the angel of the Lord says. He said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named the, that place Bochim, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. Now, the number of things that indicate that the angel of the Lord is a divine person here are, are, is simply impressive. I'll, I'll mention a few. The one that should be the most obvious to you is when he says, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Right? That's, that's, old, that's steeped in the book of Exodus. That's, that's an echo of Exodus 20 in Deuteronomy 5. Right? In Exodus 20, the Lord says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, keep my commandments. Or, Therefore, have no other gods before me, and so forth. Same thing in Deuteronomy 5. Same thing repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. Here, that language is put on the lips, or is taken up by the angel of the Lord. I brought you up out of Egypt. I led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. I'll challenge you to go home and check this out. Look up the phrase, my covenant. You'll see that it's never used of anyone other than God. The covenant is a covenant that God Himself made with Israel. He is the guarantor of it. He's the initiator of it, the one who established it with His people. So for the angel to say, I established my covenant with you, is for the angel to identify himself as God, the one who redeemed them from Egypt, the one who made Himself known, the one to whom they're uh, to hearken and, and listen. And then He says, as for you, you're to make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land, 
and, and so on and so forth. You're not to worship their gods. Notice that. He's identifying himself as their God. They're not to worship these other gods. He's not unknown to them, the angel of the Lord. Well, uh, I hope you're not so miss, uh, missing the si significance of this then. Remember, and I agree with Warfield, I agree with Warfield here, God reveals himself through redemption. And certainly in the new covenant, when God effects a greater redemption than this, he reveals himself all the more. But inasmuch as God was preparing Israel for this, in that very fact, God is disclosing himself uh, to Israel. Well, th there's much more that could be said about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, but I think my time is uh, winding down here, and I don't want to leave you without anything said about the Holy Spirit. Now, it should be obvious, I think uh, most people are probably more familiar, ironically, with the activity of the Spirit in the Old Testament than they are, I could be wrong, but uh, than they are with the activity of the angel of the Lord. But you already have explicit mention of the Spirit, don't you, in the first chapter of the Bible. After saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it immediately says the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the deep. And that language in Hebrew indicates the uh, preserving activity of the Spirit. He, in other words, He's sustaining creation. He's upholding it. And that's exactly what you read in various places, like Psalm 104, verse 30, where it speaks of God sending forth His Spirit, they're created, and He renews the face of the earth. The Spirit is repeatedly presented throughout the Old Testament as a divine person. Uh, certainly as a divine, uh, as, as to be, uh, He's not a creature, right? Uh, there are some who would try and say the Spirit's not a person. I'll come to that in a moment. But uh, the Spirit is certainly portrayed as doing divine activity. The Spirit's there at the beginning. He's, he's involved in creation. Uh, in fact, Job in, in Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. There Job is explicitly reflecting Genesis theology, right? The theology of Genesis and, of course, the theology of the Psalms. The Spirit is the one who creates. But let me show you one of my favorite Old Testament texts regarding the Spirit. Uh, 2 Samuel 23. I, I think this is a much neglected text, but it's a, it's a particularly powerful text, which, which makes its uh, neglect uh, all the more lamentable. Second Samuel 23, verse one, starting in verse 1, it says, These are the last words of David. The man who was raised up on high declares the anointed of the God of, uh, of, the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, I do have to pause here for a second. I disagree with, with the translation, and I don't have time to work all of this out. But, uh, as many have pointed out, and I, I think have the better case here, what David is literally saying is the God raised up concerning the anointed one of the God of Israel. In other words, he's saying that God raised me up especially to proclaim the truth of the coming anointed one, the Messiah. But notice what he says in verse 2. There's no question here about translation. He says, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. But notice the next clause. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me, he who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, and so forth. Did you notice it? He speaks of the Spirit as the one who spoke by him, the activity of a person. Then he uses a personal pronoun, and in the nature of Hebrew poetry, you have, where in Hebrew, uh, the poetry is typically uh, has a parallel a character to it. There's different kinds of parallelism, uh, but in this case you have him repeating basically the, the thing what he just said, but now using different words. In other words, verse 2 is being repeated in verse 3 only using different language. So when he says in verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, his word was on my tongue, that's equivalent to him saying, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me, he who rules righteously, and so forth. So here is David explicitly identifying the Spirit as a divine person, and of course, identifying the Spirit as the one who spoke by the prophets. Now, uh, I, I will have some more to say about the Spirit, but I, there's this uh, nice quotation that I have from Martin Luther here. I wasn't sure I was going to read it. Uh, but Luther, uh, this is a sermon that Luther preached on the last words of David, these words, Psalm 23. And he argues, 
that these words reveal the persons of the Trinity, and he gets into other Old Testament verses that prove this as well. But Luther asked this question, if it's there in the Old Testament, why do contemporary Jews and others not see it? And listen to what uh, Luther, Luther says. You may be tempted to ask here, and he's already spoken much of the Spirit already, but he says, if the words of David reveal the doctrine of Christ's deity so clearly, how do some miss Christ in David's words? Consider our own times. We preach the grace of Christ against our own presumptuous works and holiness. How few there are to see this or accept it earnestly. Where does the fault lie? We preach it everywhere. It's being read, written, sung, painted, and disseminated in every way so that wood and stone could understand it if these were endowed with a brain. And yet Pope, kings, princes, scholars, and peasants alike do not see it but pass it by, blind with seeing eyes, deaf with hearing ears, for their heart does not concentrate on what lies close at hand but roves about in the imagination of their minds. The prophets to whom David listens and with whom he speaks clearly foretold in their day that Christ was to be God and Lord over all. However, few believe and most follow the voice of their own fancy. This is a mystery and a mystery it remains. But let him who understands this and is sincere thank God and pay no attention to the multitude. And later in the, the same sermon, he says, behold what a good Christian uh, David was. So that the reformers, this is just an example of, of the fact that the reformers taught that the Old Testament taught the doctrine of the Trinity. Now what's interesting, uh, I mentioned that, that a lot of Christians in, in contemporary times are moving away from this and I, I believe they're hampering our ability to effectively deal with cultists uh, by doing this. Uh, you know, they're putting a weapon in their hand, if you will. And, and again, these are brothers. I mean, I'm not, you know, again, I told you, Warfield is a giant. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than Warfield. So when I disagree on this, I, I'm not uh, di di you know, diminishing anyone who holds this view. Uh, I can't think of anybody as, as, as you know, high in my esteem than, uh, than Warfield. So, but, but this position, I know uh, quite painfully through interacting with non-Christians, uh, uh, creates a very difficult scenario when trying to interact and engage with them uh, regarding the Old Testament. Uh, my own experience, which I told you I'd say something about, uh, was uh, uh, I was after a year after I was converted. Actually, I was converted for those who don't know in 1993 in prison. I grew up on the streets of California, ran with gangs, and eventually was arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada, when I was 18 years old, back in 1993. Uh, I was arrested for stealing a car, and don't worry, it's been 25 years. All your cars are safe out there in the in the parking lot. Um, but I, I was arrested and a Presbyterian minister was coming out to the prisons and I heard the gospel from his lips. But I was surrounded by anti-Trinitarians. But one of my favorite uh, individuals in the prison was an atheistic Jewish man. This man was an atheist, but he was steeped in Judaism. And we would sit and have great conversations. Uh, and I was telling some of the guys this uh, last night, one of the most memorable conversations that I had with him was when he was explaining to me what Jews do at a Seder service, right, during the Passover. Maybe you've all seen this before or heard this, but uh, uh, when he was explaining it to me for the first time, it's the first time I'm hearing this, but I'm hearing it as a Christian. And he says, here's one of the things we do. We take three meals of bread made without yeast. So there, you know, yeast is typically presented in scripture as a symbol of sin or sinfulness. So this is without yeast, right? So this, this dough is holy dough, right? It's holy. Uh, made without yeast, the middle one is taken and broken. Then it's wrapped up and hidden and the children have to go looking for it. And when they find it, they're supposed to come back celebrating that they found it, right? And as he said that, I just remember just this incredible sense coming over me and I said, what does that mean to you? And he says, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just something we do. <laughs> and I, I'm listening to that. I'm saying, that's not something I do. That's something I believe. That, that's the heart and soul of who I am. You just explained to me the gospel, right? And he didn't even see it. And that's just, I mean, that's just a small tidbit of what the Old Testament says, right? I mean, that doesn't even, I just read numerous passages regarding the, all three persons being active in the Old Testament, and I could read uh, many more. 
This is the faith of the Old Testament believer. Certainly, it's more clear in the new, but it's already there in the old. And this is why, and, and I said, I think I hinted at this, it's really ironic that Christians have been moving in an opposite direction because what's true in contemporary Jewish scholarship is that they've been going in the opposite direction. They've been arguing for years that ancient Jews, in fact, did believe in a plurality of persons in the Godhead. And let me read for you uh, a couple of quotes, um, if I can find them here. Uh, here here's an example. Uh, this comes from Daniel Boyerin, who's an Orthodox Jew. This, this still puzzles me. He's an Orthodox Jew, he's not a Christian. But, but listen to what he says. Although the official rabbinic theology, so this is post-Christian Talmudic Judaism, Although the official rabbinic theology suppressed all talk of the memra, or logos. Now I should stop here for a moment. Uh, hopefully you recognize that term logos. It's the term that, that underlies the John 1.1, 1, 1, right? When, when it says, in the beginning was the word, it says, in the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Kai, theos, ain't halogos, you know, and so forth. It's logos. John is not picking up that term from nowhere. That term comes straight out of the Jewish Targums. In the Jewish Targums, which were Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament, remember that Jews in the first century had lost uh, the ability to speak conversantly in Hebrew, largely. The Aramaic became their predominant way of speaking with one another. So what would happen in the synagogue is a rabbi who had to know Hebrew would stand up, read a portion of scripture in Hebrew, and then interpret it in Aramaic. Eventually, those Aramaic interpretations get put down in writing and become the Targums. Well, in the course of explaining the Old Testament text, they had developed a terminology that helped to make certain distinctions. And one of the things they often did when the Old Testament talked about the angel of the Lord was instead of uh, saying it in Aramaic as angel of the Lord, they would say the word of the Lord. When Genesis 19.24, one of my favorite texts, Right? Genesis 19.24 says, it's talking about Yahweh on earth, and it says, Yahweh rained fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. There you have two persons interacting with one another. One's on earth, the other's in heaven. Both are called Yahweh, right? but one rains the fire from the other. But the Targums say, then the word of the Lord rained down fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven. When Isaiah chapter 6 says that Isaiah saw the Lord, seated uh, on his throne, and the train of his road filled the temple, and then he spoke. Isaiah says, uh, Lord, the Targum says, the word of the Lord, the Memra, the Logos. It was the Logos that Isaiah saw. This is why John, after introducing Jesus in his gospel as the Logos, goes on to say in John chapter 12, that when Isaiah said these words, he was talking about Jesus because he saw his glory and spoke about him. John is familiar with the Targums. In fact, there are phrases in John that can only be found in the Targums. Do you know where John gets the title for, for God in, in Revelation 1.4 and Revelation 1.8 when, when he refers to God as the one who is and who was and who is to come? That's how the Targums interpret the I am of Exodus 3.14. When the Targums say, I am has sent me to you, that's interpreted in the Targums as, I am he who is and who was and who is to come. So, so John is familiar with the Targums, and he especially applies the Targums to Jesus. I should have brought quotes for you on that. But, but here's what Daniel Boyerin said. That was an excursion. Uh, but he says, uh, uh, Although the official rabbinic theology suppressed all talk of the memra or logos, so they're suppressing what was earlier taught by Jews, this is what Boyer is saying, they named it the heresy of two powers in heaven, meaning uh, the Lord and his word were referred to by certain Jews as the heresy of two powers. And there are other statements that are made about the spirit. But then this Boyerin goes on. But both before the rabbis and contemporaneously with them, there was a multitude of Jews in both Palestine and the diaspora who held on to this version of monotheistic theology. This version of monotheistic theology, where there are two persons in the Godhead, one of whom is identified as the Word of God. That comes, by the way, in his uh, article found in the Harvard Theological Review called The Gospel of the Memra. But notice, he doesn't just say, by the way, that this was a view held by Jews prior to the rabbis. 
He says this was a a view held by a multitude of Jews, and not just Jews outside of uh, of Palestine where you could say they were influenced by pagans and philosophers and so forth. No, Palestinian Jews held this view. Well, this view was not only held by uh, Jews, this is also most striking, it was not only held by Jews prior to the rabbinic period when it starts to become anathema, where they start to suppress it, but it was so firmly entrenched in Judaism that it was still held by extra or para-rabbinic Jewish groups. There are a lot of other Jewish groups outside of uh, the traditional or orthodox rabbinic circles that uh, continued to hold on to older traditions and uh, repeatedly refer to the angel of the Lord as a second divine person. That's true today. That's true right now that there are Jews who believe that and it's remarkable. Well, what does this mean then? Um, well, let me, let me give you just something that I think will be uh, practically useful as I, as I close. A lot of people, when they go to a text like Genesis 1.26, right, where God says, let us make man in our image, or what is along the same lines, Genesis 3.22, behold, the man has now become like one of us, or 11.7, uh, you know, let us go down and there confound their language, or Isaiah 6.8, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And by the way, do you remember? I, I told you that John said that he was seeing Jesus. This already accounts for, in part for why God speaks in the plural. But a lot of times people will say we can't interpret these passages as a reference to the Trinity. Again, because this only comes in the New Testament. You ha- uh, you know, the Old Testament Jew wouldn't have read it in a Trinitarian context. Says who? Says Isaiah? Isaiah 63, who is the original audience of the book of Genesis? Now, we we often ask this question in other places, but we forget to ask it here. Or we we kind of assume the wrong thing. The original audience of the book of Genesis is not Adam and Eve or the patriarchs. Remember, I mean, they're, they're the ones who are there at the events that are being described. But the original audience, the recipients of these words, are the Exodus generation, right? Moses was the author of Genesis. Moses wrote the Torah. And so the original hearers are those people who were rescued from Egyptian bondage by the Lord, the angel of his presence, and his Holy Spirit. So when they came to a passage like Genesis 1.26, they didn't say, oh goodness, what's this all about? You know, uh, there, there's an ancient Jewish uh, statement where uh, the Jews try and uh, uh, answer Trinitarians, uh, and it really shows up just how uh, foolish their own position is. But it says, when Moses came to these words as God is telling him to write, Moses said, Lord, why are you giving uh, an excuse here to the Trinitarians? And uh, Moses says, or, or God tells Moses, you write and whoever wants to err, let him err. Right? That's how they try to deal with it. Right? But it, they actually, I think, are onto something. Do you seriously think that Moses got to this place in Genesis and thought, us? What's that all about? And he didn't even think to ask the Lord? Do you think that Moses spoke with God face to face? And he didn't even think, you know, what's that business about, right? Where you spoke in the plural number. Did he really speak with God on Mount Sinai, right? And he's there for so long that the people of Israel are out there, you know, uh, going uh, silly in their worship, right? Creating the golden calf. Was Moses up there on the mountain and he's not asking God questions like this? Questions that naturally come to mind when we read the text? Well, I, I really don't think Moses had to ask the Lord, honestly because he already knew. He knew the God who redeemed Israel as the Lord, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. So when the ancient Israelite picked up, a verse, or picked up this text and read this verse, they didn't scratch their head in incredulity. Uh, they knew that God is a tri-personal being. They knew that the God who saved them is tri-personal. And by the way, in the first chapter of Genesis, how does God create? By his word and spirit, right? So when God says, let us make man, uh, contextually, you already have an indication. But the same is true, I'm suggesting, for when you read the rest of the Old Testament. You should read it through Trinitarian eyes. You should read it uh, with a, a mind to see Christ, not just predicted in the Old Testament, but Christ as active in the Old Testament, especially in the theophanies, the theophanies of the Old Testament. And I'll conclude with this, but the, everyone from Tertullian, the early church father, Tertullian, to Calvin referred to these uh, occasions when God appeared as a human being, 
right? He's called God and the angel of the Lord. They refer to these occasions as dress rehearsals. These are occasions when Jesus is trying on the clothes of his future incarnation. Now they're not meaning that literally, like this is literally the same body he would have, but they're saying that he is, if you will, already active and, and uh, giving us foreshadowings and anticipating what he's going to do in the future. When he comes and does something, you know, I, sometimes people ask, How could, can you really believe that God wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32? That just, doesn't that just seem beneath God? Well, God's going to do something more radical than that, isn't he? He's going to assume a human body and die the humiliating, painful, shameful death of the cross. So the Old Testament is preparing us for all of that. And I've already probably gone over, so I better, I better conclude here.